Hey guys, it's Anne. If you are new here and you are looking for an active home worm farming community, you are in the right place. Today, my goal is to show and explain my highest producing worm bin. And there's just the two things that you need to know in order to have a very productive bin. I call this the wedge system. It's a little bit modified, but we'll go through that in a little bit. And if you're not new here, you're going to see that blue has an empty spot which means that I've been doing a massive amount of harvesting. This is about 10 to 15 gallons of worm castings that I've harvested in the last three weeks or four weeks since the last time you've seen this bin. You don't need a five foot long barrel in order to have this kind of productivity. You just need a couple of good tips in order for you to be successful. So what you're seeing right here is the overs from when I do my sifting. So these are the ones that are not exactly, you know, finished. So one of the things that I have started doing that is a little bit different than what I've done in the past is I have been taking these overs that are, you know, hard bits of stuff that the worms haven't finished and very likely some worm cocoons that have gone dormant. And I've been putting these in with my prepared bedding instead of using the finished castings. And one of the things that fi finished castings have that these don't have are usually some worm cocoons. So my prepared bedding usually ages from three, two to three weeks before I start using it. And that is one of your first things that you need to realize is that you need to be prepared when you are doing your worm bin. So thinking about the end in mind and basically getting ready to be successful and harvest as much as you can in the least amount of time with your worm bins. So what you're seeing here are seeds and little bits of shells, etc., and bedding that has not fully composted. Now what I'm going to do is I'm going to take some of these overs and I'm going to put those in my bin with my prepared bedding and I will link my recipe, uh, the video for my recipe, up above here. So what we're going to do is we're just going to take a couple handfuls of this in a 45 gallon tote with my shredded paper and coconut coir and this all of the you know nutrients all of the bacteria and fungi that live within the castings as well as the little worm cocoons in here these are going to explode into growth once they get into high moisture and they are going to start turning that bedding into castings before i even use it in my worm bin so i'm going to grab this and throw it over couple handfuls. The exact amount is not, you know, 100% necessary. Scale it to whatever size bin you're using to make your bedding if you indeed choose to make your bedding ahead of schedule. For me, that makes a layer about this deep all the way across the bottom. And so now that we've got our handful of these overs, let's start moving the wedge down. Getting prepared to be successful is my first tip. So in the case of this bed, this bin, I'm doing a wedge system, which means that all of the finished stuff is down at this end. It's drier, it has very little food left in it, and the worms actually move out on their own. So as I move this over, you can tell this does have a decent amount of moisture, and it also has some worms in it. But this is the oldest edge of the bin. So we're gonna go through this and move everything down. So that's what I mean by starting off with the end in mind. My goal here is to get finished castings. Now these castings are probably about five months old, maybe a little bit older. And my goal here is to move them down here where I'm not gonna mess with them. I might put some air in them by, you know, fluffing them up every once in a while, but I'm not going to feed this end and I'm not going to purposefully give it any moisture. And in so doing, I am going to set this bin up for success for a fast harvest. So what I'm doing here is fluffing this up, moving it over. The fluffing part gets all of the air in there so that it can start drying. So little by little, we're making sure to kind of go in order. So first in, first out, Anybody who's in manufacturing will know that as FIFO, probably also in retail. 
So first in, first out. These are the oldest of the castings, and I'm very slowly moving them over in the order in which they had been started. Now these castings will start to dry over the next month or so. The worms are going to start moving down to the feeding end of the bin, leaving us with castings that we can harvest again in another month or so. So what we're doing, we're still, we're moving. We're getting into like the next area here. This part's probably three months old. Picking out any of the big pieces here, making my life easier when I go to sift. So we'll still just keep moving things over. I've had a lot of questions about the wedge lately. And one of the things is that with the wedge and the little inset diagrams that I put, I often put the 45 degree mark for the wedge. And I don't always, or let's just be fair, never um, go in the 45 degree angle. I just shove everything over. The wedge method was originally made for barns to uh, process like horse manure or cow manure. And when they were doing that, they're not doing it in a nice five foot barrel here. What they were doing is they're shoving it off to one far wall in the barn. And that way, every time they clean out a stall, they add something and possibly at the far end of the wall, they could take something out. What they were trying to do by doing the 45 degree angle was to create air. But in here, we have me as the person or method for adding air to the system. So I don't really need to do that 45 degree angle because we're not in a barn. So I am just continuing to scoop here moving everything over. And as I go around, you can see I have a lot more worms here. But that won't be true for long because we are going to get to the food end of the bin and they are going to want to move into that nice new food. Okay, and I am trying to fig, you know, fill this up pretty high because as it dries, it's going to compress. So this bin gets completely fluffed probably once a month, every other month maybe. So we're going to completely move it. I haven't done a harvest this big in a very long time, but needed a lot of castings for my beds because I've started some new raised beds recently. And I needed the worm castings to get the biology going in a brand new bed. And that's the best thing about worm castings. It's not the NPK. It is the biology in here that helps release all of the nutrients that's already in your soil. I mean, the soil already has a lot of nutrients in it for the most part. At least mine does here in the Midwest. It has a lot of nutrients, but they're locked up. And the biology in the soil isn't always sufficient enough in order to release all of those nutrients. So what I'm doing is I am supercharging my own soil so that it can release the nutrients that I already have in my soil here. Getting the sticker out of here. All right, let's move the camera down and then we will get closer to the area that's already been fed. But we're still doing the same thing. We're moving everything over so this can dry so it can cure and so the worms can move. All right, hang on, let's move over. Okay, here we are down at the business end and uh, last time I fed an enormous amount of rhubarb plants because I was tired of my rhubarb plants not producing. Um, basically, I would get some, some leaves and then it would immediately flower. I don't know what its problem was, but quite honestly, I don't eat that much in the way of, of rhubarb. I did offer the plants out to many people that I know and everybody already had their own rhubarb plant. So I did try to give it a new home, but uh, that was not in the cards. So the rhubarb is going to feed the worms. And as you can see here, I have a rhubarb plant that is still growing. I don't know if we're gonna play survival of the fittest and let this go. You can tell the worms are definitely working on that root. It's getting all mushy, but we'll move that down. Ooh, hitchhiker. 
move that down with the rest of the food. But you can tell they're already working on these big, huge rhubarb stems. Let's split this open and see if we have anybody inside. And there you go. They love crawling in little nooks and crannies for whatever reason. And you can tell they've actually got their little castings in there with them. Okay, so still moving, still pulling out the stuff. You can tell, oh, much, much wetter, much, much more worms. Ooh. Looks like they made short work of that mango seed. Take out my label here, had some radishes. There we go. And this is not super dry. There's like a seasonal problem with uh, worm bins. I go through a, a couple seasons where it gets too wet when it gets humid here and then it gets too dry when the heat goes on. But right now seems to be my sweet spot. It's June, it's 80 degrees in the basement with about 60% humidity. So everything's pretty stable. Okay, so let's see what we've got in the way of finished food. Just going to kind of pick through here and see what I have and put that off to one edge. So like I said, um, first things first, you know, what is your goal? Are you trying to get a whole bunch of castings? Well, if that is your goal, you need to think about how quickly can you harvest. And if you set up the worms to get out of your way, because that is very time consuming, waiting for worms to make up their mind to migrate. So one of the ways that I can make things go faster is kind of make the area a little inhospitable. So these worms are going to, oh, worm ball in the avocado. Look at that. I really I wish I knew it was, what it was about the avocado shells that they just absolutely love. All right, we will put the party in the avocado back, not to, you know, upset the little fellers. Okay, so we're still moving out the seeds and everything here. Let's see if we get another worm ball down here. We have an absolutely massive feeding for them today. And we are also going to give an enormous amount of bedding because I did take out um, three five gallon buckets of castings out of here. So blue is getting a little skinny. For anybody who's watching, that's the uh, uh, chicken bones from a project last summer or last winter. Okay. But somebody was asking in one of the Facebook forums, do, do worms eat uh, different things? And one of the things that uh, they were asking about specifically was rhubarb. And I told them, uh, you know, don't tell, but they most certainly do. And if you go back and look at the last video, you will see how much insane amount of rhubarb that I put in this bin. Okay. So we are getting all the way to the end. Now this bin does slope a little bit this way. So you, the moisture also kind of gravitates to that way. There are no drainage holes in here. I uh, manage moisture by, you know, adding wet or dry bedding or wet or dry food in order to mitigate any sort of problems that I'm having at any particular time with changing in moisture. Okay, so there we go. That is a big old root that they are getting into. These were completely viable roots less than a month ago. And the worms have, and their friends, you've got the little isopods in here and mites. I don't see any springtails springing around, but I'm willing to bet they're there. I usually do have a very good crop of isopods in here. There's about 15 to 20 pounds of worms in here, so I get to feed a lot of food. So if, you're, if your bin is much, much smaller, of course, you need to get a, 
get an idea of how much food you should feed in order to be successful. Oops, and they have taken apart that avocado pit. Oh, it looks like I had another worm ball that I upended. This one was actually in the avocado pit. All right, guys, well, we'll put you back. The goal is to keep moving the more finished stuff to this end and the less finished stuff to the leading end so that I focus all of my worms and worm friends on the food that needs taken care of. I don't like to, to leave the food in multiple different places just because um, I want the worms to have one location to go to so that they get out of my castings and I can harvest them ASAP. Okay, we're getting there. And then here is the last, hopefully, little mostly finished part of the casting. So this is a, a pineapple. I don't even know how old that is. I'll have to put that in above. I'll have to go back and look and see when we fed that. So everything smells great not having any weird smells, but they have totally annihilated all of that rhubarb that um, I fed the last time. So that's, that's really good. Good job, worms. Okay, so you can see how now all of these worms are here. And when they finally get finished with all of whatever nuggets of, of deliciousness is in this part here, they are going to move this way. I think that's a potato, a little tiny potato. I did harvest potatoes recently. Planted some super early in a grow bag in the basement and then put it outside. Really gave me a jump. I was able to harvest some potatoes in June. So that was, that was nice. Okay. Now, the second thing that you need to be successful is the hardest with worm farming. And that is figuring out the moisture for the bin. What is too wet? What is not wet enough? And uh, honestly, that is something that you have to basically watch what your bins do in your own environment and then write it down. In my case, I make videos. But basically, whatever cycles you're seeing within your worm bins and in your environment, you know, keep a note of that so that you can be prepared for it the next time. So like in the case of right now, this is the sweet spot. I don't have to attempt to make it wetter or drier. It is completely managed all on its own. But when we're in the middle of winter um, or in the early spring when it's super wet, then I do have to manage. First things first, I'm going to put a 10 gallon bin of prepared bedding. This is pretty dry and I wanna put that on the bottom so that the food that I'm going to put on basically will absorb into this and make it all nice and tasty so they eat. This has been in the prepared bedding bin for about a month. This part was the top that dried out in the basement a little bit and then this part here was on the bottom and you can tell how well processed that is. Now that is because if you were able to look close enough, you would see that there are springtails in there. And I think I even saw a couple worms in there. And they get started working on that bedding so that I get castings faster. So if you keep the moisture correct in the bin where I keep all of the, the bedding, then we go faster. And that's the goal, more castings faster. So let's do a super fast uh, call on forbidden food. Okay, we have an onion here and everything I'm putting in this bin works perfectly fine. Bananas, nobody's worried about those. Bread, you can tell that I soaked all of this bread in water first so that it would, you know, be kind of like paste. If you put it in dry, there's a chance that it will suck the moisture out of your castings and out of your bin and it'll kind of turn into a brick. Here's something that I haven't done before. So this is kimchi. I uh, accidentally left it on the counter and it molded. 
So unfortunately that kimchi over there is going to the worms. But I've given things that are similarly pickled. I've put pickles in the bin before. So I'm reasonably sure that kimchi will be okay just like pickles were okay. So we've got onions and then we're gonna give some more pineapple here. Lots of bananas here. Here is a rotten potato that has been frozen and also thawed mostly. So if there's any questions about, this is zucchini and carrots, and here's a tea bag. Um, all of these things will be attacked and will be eaten appropriately. Here's an avocado that didn't make it. And they will all just be exactly fine. Okay, so in order to make sure that this stays nice and uh, bug free, I'm going to get them some more bedding. Wait. But first, let's add some grit. And I'm adding this generous amount of grit for two reasons. One, I have a lot of it. It is crushed eggshell. I have somebody in my household that eats about a dozen a day. So that means a lot of eggshells. So even though the worms don't need this much grit, the garden will use it later. So it's gonna be fine. So in goes the next 10 gallon bin of bedding. And again, you can, uh, wait, wait, oh, there's a worm. Okay, so for me putting the overs from my screen into the bin with the, the prepared bedding, um, I'm actually making kind of a miniature worm bin, sort of. And uh, so this bedding, it's also got some leaves in it. It's got some coconut coir in it. And all of that will make it nice and fluffy. It'll help make the moisture even. And also this will help keep any flies or anything away from this bin. Bucket number three is a little bit drier, but this is gonna help. So the moisture will stay down low and then the drier part will stay on top, which will keep all of the, the bugs from doing things. So I pretty much filled half of the bin all at once with food and paper. All of the worms are down here for the most part. And now that this part over here has food, they're going to finish up over here because this is nice and wet here. They're not gonna wanna leave this. They're gonna stay in here for another month or two. But down there at the far end is going to become dry and they're going to move over here. And then when this starts to dry, they'll move down here. And that way, everything is very simple for me as far as moisture. Dryer, medium, wet. And that is exactly what you need in order to cycle castings as fast as possible. If you like the video, go ahead and give it a muddy thumbs up. If you're not a member of my worm family, click that subscribe button. And if you wanna know what I'm doing when I'm doing it, ring that bell icon. All right, guys, I have the playlist for this video right over here. And if you've already seen that, I recommend you watch this video over here. All right, guys, thanks for hanging out with me and my worms, and everybody, have a good day.